Welcome to Camelsville Baptist Church. You know this morning we arrive here and we're going to begin the morning by singing a song of hope. Uh, the song written, the old song that has been sung very often in the church for a long time speaks of the days of Elijah and it's a song that uh, talks about the characters of the Old Testament and the things that they were called to do and how we can learn from the character of, of folks like Ezekiel and Elijah and learn God's ways. So this morning we declare this song of hope that we are all living in the days of Elijah and we can all gather our, our hope and our influence from the lives that they live. So would you stand together and join us in singing this song this morning? Seated for just a couple moments. Uh, we want to 
just greet you this morning. Thank you so much for being here at Council Baptist Church. My name is Jeremy Linton. I'm the director of Children's Ministries here, and we're so thankful that you're here. If you're a guest with us this morning, if you'll look in your bulletin, there's a connection card right there. We would love if you would fill that out. We'd love to get to know a little bit more about you. You can put that in the offering plate a little bit later on in the service. So we have a lot going on right now, so you'll find in your bulletin we've got a ton of things happening. Um, so just read your bulletin, see all these different events going on. Um, and we just want to, again, thank you so much for being here. Now, this morning, I have just a couple of, of guests who are going to help us out a little bit this morning. So, kiddos, if I could have you guys come on up to the stage. We would like to do something a little bit special for you guys today. So, if you guys are out there in the crowd, first through fifth grade or preschool even, you guys come up here. We wanted to do something a little bit different today. There you guys go. You're good. Just to express our gratitude and thanks um, for something awesome that has, that has taken place. And so I'm going to let Angie call. She's going to come and she's going to talk for just a couple minutes about the awesome thing that this church has been able to be a part of. So Angie, I'm going to let you come talk. I just want to say, when you have spent the last four weeks teaching children about Elijah, and you show up in the sanctuary, and the first song is about Elijah, and you get to tell your children that that's what you've been talking about, your heart will explode. So that was not planned. Thank you, Ms. Jen. But that was amazing. That was amazing that these kids got to worship and sing about Elijah, and that's exactly who they've been studying. Okay, so <clears throat> a few months ago, I stood up here and thought I was giving you an update on the happenings of CCDC, and we talked about the CCDC's project of renovating and replacing the playground equipment. And um, I didn't ask, but you gave. We didn't even ask, and you just handed it over and made it happen immediately. And the kids of the church, the ones that are here on Wednesday nights, the ones that are here Monday through Friday that use it every day and hear about the love of Jesus, they have something really special they want to tell everyone who helped make this a reality. What do you want to say, guys? Thank you. <laughs> That's it. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. You guys can go back to your parents. Thank you guys so much. And thank all of you who gave. Um, for the playground. It was, I know it was an awesome thing for CCDC, um, but our kids also love it so much. There's a couple pictures, there was a couple pictures up there of the kids being goofy on the playground. Um, so we really, really appreciate all that you guys have done. We're going to pray, and then your kiddos are going to make their way back to you. Um, so let's pray together. Lord Dad, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this time we have to come and to worship your great name. Thank you so much for this church family we have, and that we can come and to worship you and to praise you. And I pray that as we continue through the service, your spirit will be felt and will move in the hearts of all who are here. I pray for Dwayne as he comes and preaches your word, and that you will use him and you will speak through him to touch hearts today, Father. Thank you so much for your love, and thank you so much for all that you've done for us. We love you, and it's your name we pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand together again this morning, singing a song of praise to the Lord for the great things that he has done, our faithful Father. Singing, we will remember
is worthy. So 
come forward, please. Would you bow with me, please? Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to come in your house to worship you, Lord. Uh, just th thank you for the opportunity to give of our resources, and may your glory and will be done with our giving today. These things we ask in your name. This time, grades one through five, uh, kids XP, please come right over here to the left. Brother Jeremy, thank you. 
This morning, uh, we know that we're in a series with Pastor Dwayne on uh, our who is your one and identifying who that person is going to be that we are going to tell the story to. So I want you, if this song is new to you, uh, to listen to these words and as it helps prepare our hearts to listen to what Pastor Dwayne has to say to us. us to the book of Romans. I thought I flipped it. How's that? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me on? There we go. All right, we're on now. It's good good to see each and every one of you this morning and worshiping the Lord Jesus. Take your Bibles and go to the New Testament, the book of Romans. We're going to be in chapter 12 this morning. We're continuing a series of sermons on the idea of one. Last Sunday, if you were able to be with us, we, we began to, a discussion of the ones in our life, who's your one that may not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And we, we sought to identify who, who those individuals or who that individual is in our life. And for the next 30 days, we're going to seek to pray for those individuals in our life who may be far from the Lord, who may not know Him. And we even uh, had cards, and we have a little visual display to kind of remind us over these next 
30 days or so to pray for those individuals in our life who need to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I want to encourage you, if you were unable to be with us maybe last Sunday or maybe you were unable to fill out a card, we have extras and over these next few weeks we invite you to add uh, to the cross over here and this visual display of us praying for those individuals in our life. And we want to encourage you um, to do that over these next few weeks. And special thanks goes out to Pastor Will and for the prayer ministry team for all their hard work in putting this together. One is, uh, it seems like such a small, insignificant number, but you know as well as I do that we should never underestimate the power of one. For example, I received an email uh, just two days ago from, or actually it was yesterday, an email from one of my, pre, one of my former teachers from, uh, from our college days. Mandy and I attended the University of Mobile. It's a lot like Campbellsville University, small uh, Baptist school there in the Mobile area. And it was such a blessing just to hear uh, from that teacher who's now retired and who's doing interims in Texas and uh, Louisiana and to hear from him and that he's praying for me and Mandy and excited to hear about what God is doing in our lives. And it was just another reminder that we must never underestimate the power of one. Uh, for those of you who are teachers or aspire to be teachers, the impact that a teacher or a professor makes upon your life is, is just off the charts. And so it's just another reminder, never underestimate the power of one. Over the summer, Mandy and I and our family had some great conversations and fellowship uh, with the Eubank family, with the Eubanks, Damon and Lori Eubank. And one thing that Lori shared with me really stuck out in, in my mind, and really it was kind of a, if you will, I believe it was the Lord using her to kind of plant a sermon seed, if you will, in my heart. And she mentioned on Wednesday nights, we were doing the Who's, Who is Your One theme on Wednesday nights. And she mentioned, she said, you know, I think that's extremely important. And I'm so glad that we're, that we're focusing on those individuals who need to know the Lord. And she said, you know, something that kind of hit me is the idea of what is your one? Not only who is your one, but what's your one? What, what is that area that God has, has wired you? Maybe that you're spiritually gifted in, that you could get plugged in to the body of Christ. And so uh, thanks to Lori for being used by the Lord. That kind of started a thought process in my heart and my brain about how we could deliver a message from God's Word and be reminded of the importance of being engaged and serving in the local body. The fact of the matter is some of you are serving in more than one area already at Campbellsville Baptist Church. And for that, I want to say thank you. And that doesn't mean you need to give up all those other duties, right? Um, but obviously, we do, we do want to serve where the Lord has gifted us, where the Lord has wired us, where our personalities uh, kind of mix with our God-giftedness, and then we are unleashed to serve in the body of Christ. For those of you who are already serving, thank you. We appreciate uh, how the Lord is using you in the local body. As your senior pastor, I want to say thank you. Some of you are here this morning. We've got people all over the spectrum. Some of you are here this morning. Maybe you've been visiting Campbellsville Baptist for some time, but you're not a member of our church. And so what we want to encourage you this morning is we, as we respond to God's Word, as we listen uh, intently, as we seek to allow the, the Word of God to transform our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit, we want to listen this morning to the Word of God with intent of ears because each and every one of us have a faith step that we need to take. And so maybe you're here this morning, and like I said, you're not a member, so maybe your next step of faith is to make a commitment to the local body, to our faith family here at Campbellsville Baptist Church. That may be your next step, and we want to encourage you to be obedient to the Lord Jesus in that. And then some of you are members. You've been members maybe for years or maybe for a short time period, but maybe you're not actively engaged 
in ministry and service through the local body. And we want to encourage you this morning, maybe, maybe God will place it within your heart, where can, where can I see where my spiritual gifts lie and then use those gifts to edify, to build up the body of Christ here at Campbellsville Baptist Church. And so from that standpoint, if you think about it, this is a message for every single one of us in this room this morning. Our text this morning is Romans chapter 12, and the Apostle Paul takes the first 11 chapters of this wonderful letter to the believers there in Rome, and he lays out some rich theological truths about Christ and who Christ is and his righteousness. First 11 chapters are deep. It's like drinking from a well. And then the last five chapters, beginning in chapter 12 through the end of the book, chapter 16, Paul begins to explain to these believers in light of and foundational, the foundational truths, these theological truths, this is how we should live and flesh out our lives in the body of Christ. This is, this is what it looks like to be believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Based upon these rich theological foundations, we want to live this in this manner. That's where we see here when we pick up in chapter 12 of Romans. And this is what we will learn this morning as we study God's Word together. Followers of Christ should humbly and sacrificially seek to serve the local body of Christ. If you would, let's pray together as we begin. Father, thank you for your word. We look forward to hearing what you have in store for us today at Campbellsville Baptist Church. And Lord, we simply say we do not only want to be hearers of your word, but God, we also desire to be doers. And so, Lord, as you present, as your word is presented through your messenger this morning, I pray, Father, that you will hide me behind your cross. And I pray, Lord, that we will listen to the truths of God's word. And I pray, Father, that we will seek to live out these truths in a way that honors you in obedience. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Really, three truths from our passage of Scripture this morning, Romans chapter 12. The first is this. Followers of Christ serve with biblical humility. Followers of Christ must serve with biblical humility. Go to the text, Romans chapter 12. By the way, don't miss... The beginning in verses 1 and 2, it's one of those passages in the Bible that maybe some of you have memorized. Uh, Paul talks about the importance of living or being living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is our spiritual act of worship. And so really, if you think about it, church, being a living sacrifice is foundational. It's foundational. If we are going to really engage and serve through the body as we're called to do, it's got to begin with us being living sacrifices, holy and pleasing, acceptable unto God. And then we will begin to see that followers of Christ gladly serve with humility. Listen to, the, listen to verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. What is Paul getting at here? Well, first, Paul is saying, don't think too highly of yourself. Don't think too highly of yourself. Paul was calling upon the believers here in Rome to not have an overinflated view of themselves. The literal translation here is, do not super think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but rather think of yourself with sober thinking. In other words, don't have an overinflated view of your own self-importance. And Paul says this in, in light of God's grace upon himself. Did you notice the language there? He said, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. And the idea here is that Paul is saying this in light of God's grace upon himself. Remember, the apostle, Paul was an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And just think about his pedigree, if you will. Think about who he was and his stature as an apostle. If anyone had room to brag, it could have been the apostle Paul, right? 
He revealed long-hidden mysteries to the church. He preached the gospel to the Gentiles. He planted and nurtured new churches. Yet, Paul never forgot that he was an apostle simply by the grace of God. And I want to remind you this morning, it's easy for us in the body of Christ if we're not careful to also have a self-inflated view of ourselves. Never forget that we are nothing without the grace of God applied to our hearts and to our lives. Paul is saying this, were it not for grace, I too would think too highly of myself as an apostle. Why did Paul make such a big deal out of thinking too much upon ourselves? Precisely because that's exactly what we have the propensity to do. We have a propensity because of our inclination towards sin and evil. We have a propensity to think too highly of ourselves. Let me share a personal illustration about this. When we came and preached in view of a call uh, back in April, I believe. Was that right? It was April? Boy, time flies, right? Um, we were very, very surprised to hear the news, I'm sure as you were, of the unanimous vote. And once we uh, met with individuals, and uh, by the way, I asked our, our children if I could share this, and the child said yes, but I won't say who the child is um, that mentioned this, but we get in the car and, or van, and we're just kind of, you know, reminiscing about the weekend and all the events and what God did and then we started talking about how highly unusual it is to ever get a unanimous vote and what a big deal that was and um, you know maybe you know getting a little big head just a little bit maybe I was and so uh, Lord has a way of humbling us amen and one of our precious precious children who shall go unnamed said Wow, Dad, they must really be desperate. <laughs> sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes we need a good dose of humility, don't we? We really do. And I think the Lord, uh, out of the mouth of babes, right? I think that was, uh, that was needed at that, that moment in time because we can begin to think too highly of ourselves even as pastors, right? Secondly, he, he says, don't think too highly of yourself, but do think of yourself with sensible judgment. Do you see that there in the, in the text? Verse 3, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone, that includes pastors, that includes church members, among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. And here's the contrast, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Uh, the scholar, commentator Thomas Schreiner said, believers are not to be proud, but to have a sober, sensible, and realistic esti estimation of themselves. What does it mean to think soberly? When we think of the word sober, we often think of the word sober in other contexts, right? To think soberly means that we understand who we are in Christ Jesus, that we understand our biblical position, that ultimately we are servants to God. We are slaves to God, and we are called to submit to one another in the body of Christ. Therefore, the idea is this. I place myself under others rather than above others. And church family, listen to me and listen to me well. We must resist the satanic thought that the church is fortunate to have me and my gifts. Did you hear me? We must resist the satanic thought that the church is fortunate and blessed to have me and my gifts. Because that is not of the Lord. That's not of Him. Think with sober judgment. Notice he goes on to say, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So in other words, this sober judgment is based upon the truth that God apportions to each one a measure of faith. And as a result, pride is eliminated when a believer recognizes that the faith that they have, guess what, is a gift from God, not a result of their own virtue or merit. 
And Paul makes this truth abundantly clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, when he says, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing spiritual gifts to each one individually as he wills. Paul was pleading with the believers here in Rome, and I would say by extension us, to not have an overinflated view of yourself. Remember, remember, all that you have, your salvation and your spiritual gifts for service are only a matter of what God has graciously given to you. Followers of Christ serve with biblical humility. Number two, followers of Christ serve with biblical unity. We serve with biblical unity. Go on in the text and it says, verse 4, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. There's some ideas here that just jump out in the text. First is this, unity is needed in the body. Unity is needed in the body. Paul used the analogy of the human body when describing the body of Christ. This is not the only place that Paul uses such language. We see the language, similar language in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And the human body has many parts with various functions. Think about bones and muscles and systems and tissues and cells. But it's only one body, one organism, if you will. That's why Paul said in verse 4, For as in one body we have many members. And likewise, so we, though many, he goes on to say, are one body in Christ Jesus. It's as if Paul in just a few verses is really trying to get across the idea to this church in Rome. We are one. We are one body. We are one organism. The body of Christ, like the human body, has many parts with various functions. So the question is, what binds us together? In all of our differences, and we're about to talk about that here in just a little bit, various body parts with various functions, what is it that binds us? Well, it's better to say, who is it that binds us? We are bound together by the gospel of Jesus Christ, ultimately by Christ himself. It is Christ that, that binds us. Re recently, I came across a, a beautiful story of, of unity uh, it's told by Tony Evans. He says there's a story of a, of a pygmy from an African tribe who was standing over a rhinoceros that he had killed. And this was an odd sight to behold, a big violent rhinoceros under the feet of a, of a small pygmy. And a guy saw this dead rhinoceros and this little pygmy over it and he said, did you kill that? And little pygmy said, yeah, I killed it. And curious, the man said, well, how did you, such a, a small person, kill this rhinoceros? And the pygmy responded, I killed it with my club. Yep, I killed this rhinoceros with a club, with my club. And the man was still, at this point, thoroughly confused. And so he asked him, he said, well, such a big rhinoceros. How big was the club that you used to kill this rhinoceros? And the pygmy said, well, there are about a hundred of us in my club. <laughs> in other words, he surrounded himself with folk who had the same belief systems and worked together so that they could handle being attacked by a rhinoceros. Now listen. I don't think I can kill a rhinoceros by myself. I don't know about you. Some of y'all are pretty tough. You might could kill a rhinoceros. But most of us in here cannot kill a rhinoceros by ourselves. In fact, I was thinking about this. I can hardly kill a fly by myself. But the fact of the matter is, church in unity, empowered by the Spirit of God, we can't be stopped. We can't be stopped. Our club, if you will, at Campbellsville Baptist Church cannot be stopped when we are empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. Unity is needed in the body. Secondly, diversity is needed in the body. We need diversity in the body of Christ. Look what he says there in verse 4. 
but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned, for as in one body we have many members, and the members, listen to this, do not have all the same function. Not all of us in the body of Christ have the same function. The body only works properly if each member of the body does its part. Otherwise, if each part of the body is not doing its part, guess what? You have a sick and deficient body. The body's not what the body needs to be or what the body could be. There's great beauty in diversity. All uniquely made by God himself and gifted by God himself. And the fact of the matter is, church, when God saved you, when you were born again, God uniquely gifted you. You have gifts that probably I don't have, and I probably have gifts that maybe you don't have. And guess what? That's okay. That's a beautiful thing. Diversity in the body of Christ is a beautiful thing. Imagine a basketball team full of point guards. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Most of the time, that's not going to be a good thing because not everybody can handle the ball, right? We don't need a team full of point guards. We need somebody that's gifted in other areas. We need somebody that can rebound, right? We need somebody that can play really good defense. We need, we need somebody that can shoot some threes. We don't need a whole bunch of point guards on a team. We need diversity, on a basketball team. Guess what? You need diversity on a football team. We don't need a team full of quarterbacks, do we? You got to have somebody to block. You got to have somebody to catch the ball. You got to have somebody to run with the ball. You got to have somebody to play defense on the other side. And the beauty of diversity is this. When everyone plays their God-given role for the sake of the gospel to the glory of God, it is a beautiful sight to behold. And so the question this morning that we have to ask is this. Are you playing your God-given role in the body? Are you engaged in ministry in the body? Diversity is needed. Unity is needed in the body. And thirdly, don't miss this, interdependency is needed in the body. What in the world does that mean? Well, look at verse 5. He says, and individually we are members one of another. There is interdependence in the body of Christ. This is a biblical concept that we must grasp. Think of it this way. Many members, one body. Therefore, we need unity. I think we pretty much all grasp that. Whether whether we live in unity or not, we would all agree that that's important. Many members with various roles, but one body. In other words, diversity. I think we get that one too. We see the need for diversity in the body of Christ. But many members with various roles in one body that depend upon one another. That's called interdependence. And I've seen many a church that struggle with this one sometimes. Here we must understand, listen to me, I need you and you need me and we need each other for this body to function properly. Are you with me? That's called interdependency. I need you and you need me and we need each other and all of us need Jesus, amen? Every single one of us needs Christ. He's what binds us together if this body is going to function properly and bring glory to the Lord Jesus. Let me give you an example of this at Campbellsville Baptist Church. You've already heard about it at the beginning this morning. Wasn't it wonderful to see all these kids on this platform? Wasn't that awesome to see that? I pray that we would continue to grow with children. We wouldn't even be able to fit them all on this platform. Wouldn't that be a wonderful problem to have? But we know that they were talking about how you played a role, church body, and being able to afford the playground equipment. And then, and then even a group of men a few weeks ago putting the playground equipment together. And I want you to think about that. Everybody on that day had a part to play. Some of us were helpers. How many of us are helpers? You know what I mean by helpers? We're, there's not a lot that we can do, but we can try to help. Are you with me? Some of us are not even really good helpers. We're better talkers, okay? That's me. 
I can encourage, well, that looks good. You guys are doing an awesome job. So some, we need helpers in the body. If that project was going to be complete on that day, we had to have helpers. Some of us were doers. I mean, I saw some men that just jumped right in, and they were doers. They were, uh, you know, getting in there and, and tightening down bolts and hammering in stakes and carrying things. They were doers. Some of us, or some, were telling others what to do. That's important, too. You've got to have a supervisor, right? You've got to have supervision. You've got to have someone that sees the big picture, that sees the vision. We had some people on, here on that day that were leaders. They led, and they kind of told the doers what to do so that the doers and the helpers could work together. Some of us cooked breakfast, or there were some who cooked breakfast for the men that morning, and then they cleaned up af afterwards. You know what? That was important. If you're going to get anybody to come to church, you've got to fix some food, right? So, I mean, that worked. That got us here to eat that good breakfast. Some of us took boxes to the garbage for the, from the playground equipment, some of the trash and stuff. Some finished the product project by spreading out mulch. Now, I want you to put all of that together, and what do you have? Well, you've got diversity on the team. There were various roles. Not everybody could do the same task. We had to have people doing various things. There was diversity. There was unity. They were working together for one common goal. We wanted to be a blessing to the children of the CCDC and Campbellsville Baptist Church and put together the playground equipment so that they could enjoy. There was interdependency on the team. The doers needed helpers to do to do, do stuff. Uh, doers needed a boss to tell them what to do. And all of us needed the food gatherers. It was interdependency. And what's the result? We'll put the picture up. That's the result. That playground was put together, I think, in record time. I mean, if we'd have tried to do it, well, if I would have tried to do it, we would still be working on it. But even some of our men that are really skilled, it would have taken them a whole lot longer to put that playground together. Interdependency, diversity, and unity is needed in the body of Christ. Now listen. Church family, if we are going to function properly in a way that honors Jesus and we see people come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and we make disciples, not only here in Campbellsville, but we make disciples to the ends of the earth. The skills that were displayed when we put this together will have to happen all throughout our church. All throughout our church. People realizing their gifts, using their gifts in the body of Christ in such a way to get the job done. Interdependencies needed in the body. Followers of Christ, we serve with biblical humility. We serve with biblical unity. And finally, we serve with biblical understanding. Look at verse 6. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Don't miss this. I underlined it in my Bible. Let us use them. It's one thing to have a gift. It's another thing to use it, to exercise that gift. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who, who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Paul had already spoken of the grace given to me in verse 3. Now he expands the dynamic to the grace given to us. So just as Paul was gifted as an apostle, so every believer of the Lord Jesus Christ is gifted in some way to serve and to build up, edify the body of Christ. Notice he says their gifts or uh, charisma, charisma originate in grace or kairos, which means that they are freely bestowed by the Holy Spirit of God to every believer. And he says, let's use them. Let us use them. Believers must understand that you are gifted by God and that those gifts are to be put to use in the body of Christ. And the Apostle Paul here and the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 4 seems to distinguish between two major categories of gifting. Speaking gifts and serving gifts. So check this out. Observe the speaking gifts first. Prophecy. He says, if prophecy in proportion to our faith. The idea is like the Old Testament prophets, this, this role 
involves social critique, calling people to repentance and revealing God's future plans for both judgment and salvation. In Old Testament times, this gift emphasized foretelling. It was a, a focus on foretelling or predicting and then also foretelling. Over and over, you'll see the prophets say, and the minor prophets, major prophets, thus saith the Lord. They are speaking forth the word of God. So there was foretelling. There was also foretelling. And notice he says, in proportion to our faith. The New Living Translation is helpful here. It says, so if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speaking out with as much faith as God has given you. Most, most scholars believe today the leaning here in the gift of prophecy is more towards foretelling today in lieu of foretelling or predicting. Speaking, thus saith the Lord, speaking forth the word of God. Secondly, teaching. This is speaking gifts. The one who teaches in his teaching. Teaching is to understand and communicate God's word in a clear and relevant manner. Some of the best Teachers, by the way, in the local church never preach from this platform, yet they are faithful men and women who teach in other contexts, discipleship classes, Sunday school classes, whatever the case may be, teaching. Thirdly, exhorting. He says the one who exhorts in his exhortation. What is exhortation? It's, it's a gift of encouraging and comforting and confronting and instructing others. It's a gift which enables a believer to faithfully call others to obey and follow God's truth. That's the speaking gifts. Secondly, notice the serving gifts that Paul discusses here in verses 6 through 8. He begins with service. If service in our serving. Serving does what? Is to provide practical help to meet the needs of others. By the way, something that we did for you, and I left mine at, at, at my pew, but in your bulletin, we gave an insert of many of the ministries here at Campbellsville Baptist Church. Now listen, it, it may not be exhaustive because there's a lot of ministries. There may be some that we left out, not on purpose, but maybe inadvertently, but I think this gives you a really good snapshot of some of the ministries here at our church. There's a lot of them. There's tons of opportunities for you to be involved through the local, through the body and the ministries here at Campbellsville Baptist Church. We tried to put a name with each one of these ministries. We want to encourage you to pray over that list as you begin to seek what is my one? Where's the area that God has gifted me and how can I utilize my gifts in the body of Christ? Well, here's some great opportunities here at Campbellsville Baptist Church on that insert. So service. Secondly, giving. Giving, the one who contributes in generosity. The gift of giving does what? Well, it supplies physical resources to meet tangible needs. Don't miss what's our motive for giving. We're not to give for man's applause, but to help meet needs. And ultimately, we give to bring glory to God. By the way, side note here, just because you may realize that you aren't gifted to give doesn't mean you aren't commanded to give. We're all, so not all of us have the gift of evangelism, but we're all called to proclaim Christ and make disciples of all nations. Just because you're not gifted doesn't get you off the hook, okay? We're still commanded to give. We're still commanded to make disciples of all nations, whether we're gifted in those areas, areas or not. Thirdly, leading. The one who leads with zeal. The gift of leading is to motivate, coordinate, and oversee others in ministry. Paul will call it in 1 Corinthians 12, the gift of administration. And the New Testament word means to guide. And it's used of a person who would steer the ship. And he says, do it with, with zeal, to lead with eagerness. Leaders can be prone to get lazy in their leading. And so the idea here is to lead, but do it with zeal. Do it with excitement. And then fourthly, showing mercy. The one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. What does that mean? The gift of mercy is, is, a, is a gift where people perceive hurts and gently and lovingly console those who are hurting. To show mercy is to care for anyone who is in, the need, who is in need or distress. Refugees, widows, orphans, disabled, sick, or dying. It's a, it's a call to show mercy with cheerful, cheerfulness instead of 
trying to show mercy with an attitude of complaining or bickering or whining. Now, I want you to do something with me just real quickly. Imagine that all seven of these gifts, speaking gifts and sharing gifts that we've shared this morning, are represented in a group that met for dinner and someone dropped their dessert on the floor. I read this illustration many years ago, and it really kind of helped me. So here's some possible responses. This may help you as you seek to identify which of these or which ones of these seven gifts maybe you're gifted with. The prophet might say, well, that's what happens when you're not careful. <laughs> you drop your dessert when you're not careful. How many prophets do we have out there? I see a few hands, yes. Well, that's, you know, the motivation for the prophet is to correct the problem. Correct the problem. So some of you may be prophets. Some of you may be servers. And a server, guess what, would say, oh, let me help you, let me help clean that up. That dessert that you dropped, I want to help clean it. What's their motivation to, to provide a need? How many servers do we have out here? Raise your hand. Okay, I see servers. Thirdly, the teacher might say What? Well, it fell because it was too heavy on one side, which could have been avoided if you'd have checked the balance of the dish when you made the dessert or before you lifted it from the counter. How many teachers do we have out there? Okay, I see some hands. The motivation for the teacher is to discover why it happened. Fourthly, the exhorter. The exhorter might say, next time serve the dessert from a different dish and everything will be all right. The exhorter encourages, their motivation is to encourage and uh, to prepare for the future. The giver, what would the giver say? I'd be happy to buy you a new dessert. That's the giver. How many givers do we have out there? Now I see hands. The motivation is to give to meet a tangible need. The leader or the organizer, what would they say? Jim, would you go get the mop? And Sue, please help pick it up. And Mary, come help them fix uh, another easy dessert, right? So the motivation there is to help the group work together to achieve their immediate goal. How many, te or how many leaders do we have out there? Any leaders? I see some hands. The person with a gift of mercy, what would they say? Oh, don't feel bad. I've done that before. In fact, I did it the other day. I dropped my dessert. It could happen to anyone. What's the motivation for the person showing mercy? To comfort the person responsible for their mess and offer sympathy. So you get the idea here. You, you can see all these gifts at work in such a simple way. But just think about it in a greater scale in the body of Christ. And so let me do something with you this morning. I want to strongly encourage you to identify, begin to pray and identify your spiritual gift or gifting. There are free spiritual gift inventories online, or we would be glad to help you. You can speak to me or Pastor Jeremy or Pastor Will. Why is this so important? Some people say, Pastor, what's the big deal? Well, quickly, let me, let me tell you why exercising your spiritual gift in the body is a big deal. Number one, because of God's glorification. That's why. And that ought to be reason alone enough, right? I mean, we should desire to bring glory to God. Whether we eat or drink, whatever we do, that we bring glory to God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. And so the idea is that we want to bring God glory. 1 Peter chapter 4, the Apostle Peter said, As each received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Now listen to this. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So the Apostle Peter understood when the gifts are exercised and used in the body, when spiritual gifts are used, God receives the glory. And I would add to that, Satan is horrified. God's glorified, Satan is horrified when we begin to engage and use our gifts. Secondly, not only Christ's glorification, but the church's edification. Edification, in other words, building up of the local body. Spiritual gifts are dispensed in order to help build up the body of Christ and lead her to maturity. If, listen, the converse of that is if you fail to use your spiritual gifts or you allow them to decline because of lack of use, the body of Christ 
will suffer. Not only do you suffer because you're not using your gifts, you don't, even, you, you don't know your purpose in the local body, the, the body itself suffers. It's a deficient body. Some of the body parts aren't doing what they've been called to do, and consequently, it affects the whole body. The body suffers. And then thirdly, not only his glorification and, and the church's edification, the believer's satisfaction. Knowing and using your spiritual gifts will allow you to discover a significant part of your purpose for living. And you will also have a sense of fulfillment and joy in serving others. So what have we learned this morning? Followers of Christ should humbly and sacrificially seek to serve the local body. Now, what's your next step? What's your faith step? Identify it. First and foremost, are you in Christ Jesus? Has there ever been a time where you have repented of your sins and you have turned to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation? That's, that's the first step of obedience. That's the, that's the first step of faith that we all must take. So are you in Christ? Secondly, this morning, are you a member of Campbellsville Baptist Church? If not, we invite you this morning in just a few minutes. We're going to pray. We're going to have a time of response. We invite you to come and, and say, you know what? I want to make a commitment to this local body. I want to join this fellowship. We invite you to come and join our faith family. That may be your next step of obedience, your next step of faith. Maybe some of you say, Pastor, I'm a member, but I'm not an involved church member. What's your one? We gave you a, a sheet that you can begin to pray through. Where, what's your one area? And by the way, if you'd say, I'm not, I don't feel led in any of those areas. Well, how can we come along beside you? We'll start some new ministries. Maybe one that you're excited about and you would love to see happen here through Campbellsville Baptist Church. What's your one? And then finally, are you involved but, but you lack the proper motivation? By the way, the very ending of this, I wish we had time to look at it, is look at verse 9. I'll just read this one verse and we'll be finished. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. What is the Bible reminding us? As you serve in the body of Christ, use your gifts. Use them for God's glory. Use them to build up the body. Use them to bring personal satisfaction as you enjoy and you're able to serve the Lord in the local body. But I would add this. Do what you do with love. Do it with a heart of love. You know, you can do all of these things and do it with the wrong heart, with the wrong motivation. And so it's almost as if the Apostle Paul's kind of jumping ahead of the game and, and even realizing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that some of these people in the church of Rome are doing a lot of stuff and over time the people that are doing a lot of stuff can get tired and wore out and they begin to do it for the wrong reason. Can I get an amen or an oh me? Amen. Yeah. So he reminds even those of you that are serving faithfully do it with love. Love Jesus and love others. Would you stand with me? What's your one? What's the area of ministry that the Lord Jesus is calling you to? I'm not trying to guilt you. Listen, if I could go out there and guilt you into doing something, somebody else could come along and change your mind, all right? So this is not a guilt trip this morning. That's not the purpose of this. The purpose of this is for you to sit back and say, Lord, here I am. What do you want me to do? How do you want me to be engaged in the body of Christ? By the way, this is for children too. This is for teenagers. This is for college students. I think sometimes we get the idea, well, when I get into my 20s, then I'll start serving. No, it is right now, right now. How can I serve? What's my one? How can I serve in the local body of Christ. Would you pray with me? Father God in heaven, we thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This wasn't a sermon to try to beat up the church. This was a sermon to say, church, what are we doing for the glory of God? How can we do it more effectively? And making sure that we do it with the right spirit, a spirit of love. 
that we would check our hearts and we would look at Romans 12, 1 and 2 and we would ask ourselves the question, am I a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is my spiritual act of worship? Lord, I, I pray that over this congregation this morning that we will begin to discern by the Spirit of God are we living sacrifices for you because if we are, then we will take that next step of faith. Whether it's to join this fellowship, whether it's to get engaged further in this fellowship, or whether it's to serve with the right mindset and attitude in this fellowship. All for you, Jesus. All for you and your kingdom. And so, Lord, in this, this time of response this morning, we pray, Lord, that you will have your will and have your way. If there's any person here that doesn't know if they're in Christ, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. I pray as soon as I say amen to this prayer, they would come and take one of these pastors by their hand and say, Pastor, I need to know Jesus as my Savior. But Lord, maybe some people would just come down to this old-fashioned altar this morning and would just say, Lord, what would you have me to do? to be pleasing to you, and to be used in this body. Lord, would you move, would your spirit move in our hearts and lives today? In Christ's name we pray, amen. We invite you to come this morning. We're going to sing. Uh, there's some pastors that will be available. If you need somebody to pray with you, we invite you to respond to the Lord Jesus this morning. as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is our spiritual act of worship. Lord, that we will seek to identify our place in the body of Christ. We will seek to know what's our one. What areas can we serve to build up, edify the body, to bring glory to Jesus and for our own personal satisfaction. Lord, would you lead us and guide us by your Spirit. And God's people said,
Amen. Amen. If you'll be seated just for one moment, uh, Pastor Will's going to come. As he's coming, let me just share this. Tonight at 6 p.m., we're going to continue our study in the book of James. Uh, we'll meet in the fellowship hall for that, 6 o'clock. So be sure to come and join us for that time of Bible study in the book of James. Well, we've got a, a special moment that, that we'd ask that you would um, not only be in prayer with, but kind of kind of help us with this morning. We've got Ashley that's going to come forward and, and the group that has um, been supporting her and helping her. Um, I want you to come down as well. And uh, um, we're going to have a time of prayer. Ashley has had to make some tough decisions over the last um, few weeks. She accepted Christ a few weeks ago and, and Tish had the privilege of baptizing her in the pool at the rehab facility. She has CF, cystic fibrosis, and um, she's made some, some decisions to uh, come off of that medicine. And so we want to have a time of prayer for her this morning. And, and what I would ask you to do um, CF, and she's not on her medicine, immune system, things like that. We want you to sit in your seat, but we would like for you to just lift your hands towards her this morning. She's not. Oh, she's, she's not prayed for healing at all. She's not asked that. She is asked that God takes care of everything, that she's comfortable, and that other people through her during this time can come to know Christ. The time is uh, kind of up in the air of how long. So this morning, Brother Dwayne is going to come and he's going to pray. But I just ask that you just lift your hands to her, towards her, uh, as Brother Dwayne leads us. You would let's just pray together feel free amen lord we um we come before you and god we um we're just humbled to see how your spirit is at work in ashley lord i just, i look up to her and her faith in you and her trust in you I think of what the Apostle Paul said, um, uh, to, live, to live in Christ, uh, to die is gain. And so, Lord, we pray, may your will be done, first and foremost. Lord, we know that you are more than powerful enough uh, to bring healing to Ashley. We know that. God, we also know that you... Have, you are powerful enough, you conquered death in the grave, and you may be ready to bring her home as well. And so, God, we trust you in that. You are sovereign. You are providential. We pray that your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And, Father, we pray that you will give her strength. Lord, that you would ease any pain and discomfort that Ashley may be in. Lord, that during this season that she will trust you that she will depend upon you that she will cast all of her cares upon you Jesus we pray Lord for for those who are watching her Lord would you teach us how to minister to her how to serve her how to encourage her Lord, for those who are watching her that may not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, we pray, Lord, that they will come to know you. Lord, we pray again, your will be done in Ashley's life. Lord, bless those who are loving on her, who are supporting her, who are encouraging her even now. God, give them wisdom. Lord, bless her. Use her as you already are, God. You're using her to teach us. And so, Lord, may your perfect will be done. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you because of Jesus that the grave is not the end. <laughs> oh, death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? 
We thank you because of Jesus, his death on the cross and his resurrection, that, Lord, we can even endure moments of life like this as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, all because of Jesus and the hope that we have because of him. So, Lord, bless our sister. Strengthen her, empower her, encourage her, and God, may you and you alone receive all the glory for what you're going to do and what you are doing and what you will do in and through her life. This is our prayer. And God's people said, amen. 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 You are dismissed. Thank you all for being here this morning.